and welcome to another broadcast. Tonight we're going to do a broadcast of one of many of the comparison and contrast between F.G. Smith, Revelation Explained, and the Seven Seal Teachings. But before we begin, let's listen to a little bit of a song called You Ought to Sing, page 467 in your Evening Light Songbook. Well, we surely should sing tonight. I invite you to listen to our Monarch Springs Camp Meeting channel. You're going to listen to a lot of new, no doubt new to you, songs that you've never heard. So we want to begin tonight, and I just want to say this before I get started, that the task that I have chosen to undertake is set forth for these reasons. 
to hopefully encourage those who will seek God for understanding to see what I believe has not either been proven or in some cases, some scripture has been entirely overlooked. I have requested several Seven Seal ministers to join the broadcast, including some that have written books, but so far all have declined. I promised, and I do promise not to censor them, nor to remove their thoughts off of my channel, even though I may disagree, or to intentionally hurt them in any way. So if you know of a seven seal minister who would like to prove his beliefs, please have him contact me or her at 405-820-8023. I do realize this is a complicated matter, so I will try with all that is within me to present both sides with equal treatment and fairness. Now, at the end of the day, some would say, well, um, <laughs> let me see here. It would say this, and this is not on my script. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show his servants things which must shortly come, shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So from that scripture there, they would say that the reason that we can't understand some things is because we are not a servant. Well, then I would just have to ask you this. Were the brethren in the evening light at the beginning of the evening light servants? Does everyone that you know Understand the book of Revelation? No, of course not. So we know that God in his own time will reveal some things. But I do want to say this. Uh, the next uh, paragraph states this very plainly. This book came from the throne of God. It contains a warning not to add to or take away because of serious consequences. And that's found in chapter 22 and verse 18 and 19, the Bible says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall uh, add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. If any man shall take away from the words, the words now, notice that that's, let me tell you something about the book of Revelation. Every word in here matters. Every single word matters and some people they won't believe that they'll believe that i'm getting too technical but i'm sorry the bible says if any man shall take away from the words not the belief not the understanding now the words of the book of this prophecy god shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and the things which are written in this book now, if you have some thoughts or a belief uh, that you think I need to clear up, or if I can clear up for you, please email me at Wingate, that is W-I-N-G-A-T-E-T-A -E at gmail.com, and I will get you information as soon as I can. Now, this, it's obvious, I mean, if you take a look at even uh, Brother Smith's book, I believe it's like 400 pages or so. So I can't uh, take everything that he said, neither can I take everything the seven seal uh, said. What I tried to do um, in this prospect was to take it verse by verse and find what they said about the verse, if they said anything, and um, then compare it to what Brother Smith said. And then what we're gonna see is, did they try to prove it by the scripture? I want you to think of something before we get into this. The Bible says that, and I'm getting way off script here, but that's okay. The Bible says, 
John said, chapter 5, verse 2, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming, proclaiming with a loud voice, who is able, who is worthy, I should say, to open the book. Now, that's an interesting statement because at this time, Brother John had been an apostle for at least 60, 70 years, maybe 65 years or so. This was AD 95. Uh, he would have gotten saved around, I don't know, AD 30 or so. So I'm just, I mean, estimating here, uh, 65 years. So this here, this worthy must not mean, it must not be talking about salvation. Now, these are my words. This isn't part of Brother Smith or them. I'm only saying this to make a point is it seems that there was a big deal made about this and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book. Neither to look thereon, they couldn't even look at the book. But we see here in chapter uh, five and five, it says, and one of the elders said unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. And that lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus Christ, the lamb. And we see that in the next verse, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven heads. And we'll get into all of that. But this was interesting to me because we know that Jesus, when he left, he told his disciples, I'm going to send you another comforter. He's going to lead and guide you into all truth. So I wondered then, why didn't, the Holy Ghost opened the book rather than Jesus. Well, my opinion and my belief is this. The reason it states that is because God wants us to look within the scripture to find the interpretation. It came out of God's hand. So therefore, God wants to look within the scripture. And what is the scripture? It's the Word of God, or it's Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's talking about Jesus. So God wants us to look within the Scripture, or the Word of God, and then the Holy Ghost, as He sees fit in due season, will open the understanding. And I personally believe that's part of the problem. In desiring to make this podcast, some assumptions on my part have been made. In order to accept and believe Brother Smith's teachings in the Revelation Explained, one would have to believe that all prophecy was fulfilled by the year 1906. Now, we do believe, I do believe that, uh, I, I don't have it right here, but in, somewhere in the book he said that some more understanding may come along. But some people do hold to this, firm to this belief of F.G. Smith. I want to make this point that 118 years have passed since his first publication. That's about 5% of the entire gospel day. So it is reasonable to believe that his interpretations are probably outdated. And although he was a wonderful brother as a whole, they simply are not accurate. The same can be said for the seventh seal. The first interpretation of the seventh seal was written in 1930. And that was 94 years ago. By 1960, however, the seventh seal interpretation had changed six times. I have three different interpretations in my possession, and there's another interpretation that I found on the internet, and we're going to see that as we go along. I have no doubt that many others have different thoughts on the book. That's not to suggest that there's some of their thoughts aren't accurate or that even Brother Smith's thoughts aren't accurate. That's not to suggest any of that. It's just to make a point here. If you go back to Daniel and you see when God revealed the interpretation, there wasn't any guesswork and there was only one interpretation. This series of podcasts are not designed to teach either interpretation, but rather to show where Passages were either missed or statements were made without proof whatsoever. I do not accept that God 
personally gave Jesus the book so that we would be running all over the place trying to decide what the understanding is. So God gives the book to Jesus, and then we've got people all over the place coming up with new ideas and understandings. That's not to say that God wouldn't reveal something, but God, through Jesus Christ, still has to break the seals or the understanding to open to our mind and hearts, and he knows when to do this. It is my hope that these podcasts are taken in the spirit in which it was delivered and done. I will not accept blanket statements by either interpretations because that is inconsistent with God's word. What I mean by that is someone just says, this certain thing means that without proving it. I'm sorry, but I will reject that. Now, you can decide, you can make up your own mind of what you believe, and I'm not going to say whether you're right or wrong, because we are all learning, right? Now, we reject, and this is true, the Church of God as a whole, we reject many other interpretations like the Left Behind series, the Millennium, the Rapture, or that Jesus is going to set up a literal kingdom in Israel simply because they seem to make it up as they went along. We know that if you listen to preachers or if you look at anything that's out there now, you'll see that every other day there's a new statement being made about the revelation. It changes all the time. So just because now an interpretation is Church of God or has come from a Church of God minister, we cannot accept that either. It must be proven by the Word of God. It must be clearly proven. If not, at least part of the belief is incorrect. Now, I'll tell you this, that maybe some of the things I just couldn't find the proof. I had, uh, and I'll I'll go through the different books that I was looking at for the seventh seal. And um, they didn't really, or they haven't really written a complete volume to explain everything in detail like F.G. Smith did. Truth does not mind being challenged. I want to say that again. Truth does not mind being challenged. If at any time during this broadcast, you would like for me to clear up a thought or statement, or even when you think I have erred, please contact me and I will do my best to correct it in a timely manner. For sake of time and clarity, I cannot read all of what F.G. Smith wrote or what the Seven Seal has written. So I have painstakingly, and I mean this, it takes a lot of time, taken the time to read to find the discrepancies and try to give you a bird's eye view of the belief of both parties. I am looking for scripture to prove, to be used to prove this mighty book. If scripture is not used, I will not even present the writer's point of view for it is useless, sinking sand, and it has no foundation. Remember the little song that children sing about being on the rock? Or we the adults we sing on Christ the solid rock I stand? What that means is we're standing on the word of God. Now, you'll see that I have done this even though I made that statement because I know that there's a lot in one of these books um, where they didn't, he didn't use any scripture. I'm not looking to vindicate or prove either side, but rather to show that we all need to humble our mind to God, perhaps realize the whole world lieth in wickedness, begin to love our neighbors ourselves, and perhaps travel to foreign lands to fulfill the law of Christ, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Then perhaps we will see gifts, like gifts of healing, gifts of miracles, as in the morning time. We will love each other and firmly hold onto the unity of the Spirit. And this comes from everything that's in me. Now, you're probably wondering as you're looking at this, why did you start in Revelation, the fourth chapter? Well, I started here because the first Revelations 2 and 3 is primarily the seven seal interpretation of those um, uh, cities, Laodicea and Philadelphia and Ephesus and all that is a seven seal. They believe that is a spiritual and a physical interpretation. So I didn't want to start this out by starting that way. I wanted to start where we can actually begin to see the differences. So we're going to start in Revelation, the fourth chapter, 
Now, I'm not going to read this chapter because we're going to begin, as you can see, with each verse. Now, Revelation 4, it says, After this I looked, behold, a door opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, one sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like a jas jasper and sardine stone, and there was a rainbow about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Round about the throne were twenty-four seats, and upon the seats I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceedeth lightnings, thunderings, and voices. And there were seven lamps of God, lamps of fire, burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf. And the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor, and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the twenty and four elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy to receive glory, honor, and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. It is probable, now this is F.T. Smith, I'm going to substitute this word for apocalypse for a revelation, okay? And there's no reason for that word. That the revelation was communicated to John in parts or consisted of a series of symbolic visions. This is indicated by the expression, after this I looked, and is confirmed by the words following, and immediately I was in the Spirit, implying that the vision recorded in chapter 1, which was given on the Lord's day, had been erupted and that a new one now began when the angel with trumpet voice gave summons for him to ascend to heaven in the Spirit. Or, as he said, under the influence of the Spirit of prophecy, to behold the events of the future passing before him as a vast moving picture. Or as we would say, like a video. The fact of John's ascension to heaven to behold certain visions of the future, which began properly with chapter 6, will serve to explain many allusions to these things said to occur in heaven, merely signifying that John was in heaven when these things were revealed to him, although their fulfillment was intimately connected with the affairs of the church on earth, for whose benefit the revelation was given and unto whom it was sent. Now, we're going to read the next paragraph, but it's lengthy, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can pause the video and read it if you like. Um, you, you see here, he, everything's in green, probable. What that means is he's not certain. That's what it means. Um, one of the questions I had here was, if you look on the right, is that he did not designate which heaven. Was it the literal heaven where God is? The heaven where we look out the, um, you look up in the sky? Or is it the spiritual heaven? John saw a throne, and as we'll read, Brother Smith assumes it's a symbol without proving it's a symbol. <laughs> so let's read this. When the apostle ascended through the door that had been opened unto him, 
The first object that met his vision and absorbed his soul was a throne, with the Almighty seated upon it, around whom all the inhabitants of heaven were assembled. He writes, no symbol is given for the reason that there is no object that can be chosen as his representative. True, John saw a throne, but that is a symbol, not of God himself, <laughs> but of supreme power and authority. One was seated upon the throne, separate from the throne itself. It is not said that a jasper or sardine stone was seated thereupon, for that would have for that would be to make such an object the representative of God. But he that sat on the throne was to look upon like Jasper. The Jasper mentioned was in all probability the diamond, as is described in chapter 21 and 11. This description naturally suggests the vestments of a great monarch and position and power of authority upon his throne. The main idea then, as it's here expressed, is, the, is that the appearance of the Almighty was so inexpressibly glorious that it could be likened to nothing except the beauty of the most resplendent gems. Now, let's go back to our comments on the right. Brother Smith, later on in his commentary of, of this chapter, says the elders were casting their crowns before the throne. This is illogical and inconclusive in his interpretation. For how can the elders cast their crowns before another symbol? Do you understand my point? It's not a symbol. Jasper Stone was all probability the diamond. Now, it's, this is not a really easy read, honestly, Brother Smith's book. I don't know why it was so difficult. Uh, it just seems that um, he wanted to use words. Um, and I'm not being critical. I'm just seeing it just seems to be very, it's a very hard read. And it shouldn't be a hard read. The throne of the omnipotent one was surrounded by a beautiful rainbow of emerald clearness and was probably a perfect one. So here we are again. The Bible tells us not to add to or take away. And so far, we in just in this fourth chapter, Brother Smith has used the word probably, probable, probable. Now, that's not to say he's sinning, his name didn't get taken. No, the point is, is that when God gives the interpretation, there is no probably, there is no probable. It's very clear and distinct. The rainbow, he said, on the cloud to Noah and his descendants constitutes a sure pledge of God's covenant promise not to destroy the earth with another deluge. So also the bow surrounding the throne is a symbol of God's covenant favor with his people eternally. Now, here we are again. Um, I, I don't know how to say this, but uh, it would have been nice if he would have had a scripture to prove that. I know he's using logic, and I understand that. But that's what everyone does, and that's how we get all of these different interpretations. There were lightnings and thunderings and voices proceeded from the throne, the same outward manifestations as heralded the Godhead when he came down on Mount Sinai to declare his holy law. The seven lamps of fire burning before the throne are said to signify the seven spirits of God. These are not lampstands or candlesticks, such as one in the midst of which the Son of God walked on earth, but seven lights or flames of fire representing the Holy Spirit upon the hearts of men and women. Surrounding the throne also was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In the Greek, it stands in a little different form, and before the throne, as it were, a sea of glass. Describing the same object in chapter 15 and 2, the revelator says, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass. It was a broad expanse spread out before the throne, 
with a glassy or transparent appearance like crystal. Its signification will be made hereafter. In addition to this description of the throne and deity, our attention is directed to certain objects before and surrounding the throne. Four beasts, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, <laughs> four beasts and four and twenty elders are brought into view. The word beast is a very unfortunate translation, which unnecessarily being unnecessarily associated in our minds with the brute creation. It is not the word therion, which in 35 instances in the apocalypse is translated beast, denoting an animal of wild disposition, but the word zoon, which signifies a living creature, and is thus rendered by, the, by many of the translators of the New Testament. Their being full of eyes signifies sleepless vigilance and superior intelligence and discernment. The chief description given of the first living creature is that it was like a lion. It is stated not that the creature was a lion, but that it was like a lion. It possessed some peculiar quality characteristics of the lion, namely strength and courage. The second living creature, like a calf, or more properly, the ox, is symbolic of sacrifice or a patient labor. The third, with the face of a man, denotes reason, while the fourth, like a flying eagle, is the emblem of swiftness and far-sighted vision. Now, he made some assumptions, and believe it or not, all four of these beasts, these living creatures, and the heaven that they're in, is going to what you're going to see is there's like four different beliefs on that. He made some assumptions. Seven lamps of fire are said to signify the seven spirits of God are the operation of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'll say this I do believe that. I wish he would have proven it. Because, see, if we don't prove things, then guess what? We're no different than any other person interpreting the revelation. My belief, friend, is just as good as yours, and yours is just as good as mine, unless we use the Bible to prove it. And that goes with anything that we do. The lion possesses strength and courage. Well, we know it does. And what he's saying is these are the two, um, it's his belief that these are the two things that um, that, that beast or that new cre cre creature signifies. The calf, an ox, a symbol of sacrifice and labor, the face of a man denotes reason, flying eagle denotes swiftness and far-sighted vision. He shows that the word beast actually means living creature, and I do believe that. But the peculiar qualities thus symbolized are possessed by the four living creatures themselves. And what do they represent? To whom are the four living creatures referred. They are particularly distinguished from the angelic throne. In the ninth verse of the following chapter, the elders and the living creatures represent themselves as the host of people redeemed by the blood of Christ out of every kindred, and tongue, and people and nation. This is important, these next two um, slides. The above-mentioned characteristics, then, are the peculiar possession of God's people, power and courage to attack all enemies, to gain the victory, a spirit of perseverance and patiently laboring for Christ, and a willingness to sacrifice their, sacrifice their lives if necessary. For the glory of God, ability to receive the knowledge of the truth, that they may understand the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning them, and power and willingness to obey instantly when they, when able to discern spiritual things rising above the things of earth and the trials and persecutions of life, soaring away to loftier heights than to bask continually in the blessed sunlight of God's eternal present. Why was it necessary, he asked, that the redeemed company of God's people should be represented by four living creatures? He says, doubtless, because 
it would probably have been very difficult to select any one creature combining all the characteristics desired to represent God's people of all ages. Okay. Now, what he's going to say here is very important. Okay? Because we're going to get back to this in a little bit. He's saying here that these four living creatures represented God's people, are the characteristics of God's people of all ages. It is also a significant fact that all the people of God on earth were included in four great dispensations, antediluvian, postdiluvian, mosaic, and Christian. Although it is not certain that four living creatures were selected for the special purpose of showing the number of dispensations, however, this division of time is well established in the Bible. Peter reckons a new world beginning with Noah, 2 Peter 3, 6 through 7, stating that the old world had been divorced, uh, destroyed. 2 Peter 2 and 5, God came down from Mount Sinai and delivered the old covenant, thus marking a distinct dispensation. While Jesus Christ established a new covenant and ushered in the fourth and last dispensation. See Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. Under the first dispensation, Abel, by faith, offered unto God an excellent sacrifice. Men began to call upon the name of the Lord, Genesis 4, 26. Enoch walked with God and was translated that he should not see death, while Noah, a preacher of righteousness, was perfect in his generation and condemned the world by his preaching and obedience. The second dispensation was grace with Father Abraham, or faithful Abraham, who staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, from which circumstance he was called the friend of God and justly received the title Father of the Faithful. In his footsteps followed Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Moses. The Law Age contains the names of many illustrious prophets of God, and the New Testament era abounds with brilliant examples of faith and devotion. Now, there's some good points here. The ninth verse of the following chapter. The elders and the living creatures represent themselves as a host, a people redeemed by the blood of Christ out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. And I have it here. And they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue, people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, the beasts and the elect elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousands and thousands of thousands. Now, here... He contradicts verse 1. Come up hither, and I will show you the things which be, must be hereafter. By applying these four beasts for all time. Okay? The Bible says, verse 1, Come up hither, and I will show these things which must be hereafter. And then he applies it for all the redeemed of all ages. Okay? So I'm just wondering, can that be? So this entire paragraph should be excluded from any interpretation of the book of Revelation because he was shown things which must come hereafter. This is all Brother Smith now. The ministry of John the Baptist cannot be said to form another dispensation because of its short duration. He preceded Christ by six months. Let's jump down to the green. Also, John's work, according to the evangelist, marks the beginning of the gospel dispensation, Mark 1, 1 through 4, from which time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. Now, let's read the next, the next paragraph. It was by virtue of the future atonement work of Christ that 
any were enabled to enjoy God's favor in the Old Testament times. Even their sacrifices, which originated in the family of Adam and which were continued from generation to generation, pointed forward to the sacrificial offering of the Savior, and by this means purchased covenant favors from heaven. So after all, the atonement was for their benefit as well as for ours. Paul expressively informs us that Christ died for the redemption of the transgressors that were under the First Testament. Hebrews 9 and 15, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets were in the kingdom of God. Let's look at this. Let's make sure it's what that says. Hebrews 9 and verse 15. I didn't think to add it to the slides. Let's just get our Bible. It's always good to get your Bible out. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that my means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, or the, what we would call the Old Testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Isn't that wonderful? Then he has another scripture, Luke. Look at that. 13, 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac, Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. So Brother Smith took part of this chapter and applied it to the whole time on earth. I'm not sure... I'm not sure why he felt that way because the book is referencing the time period that he was shown the vision until the end of time. As we will see in future references, that this cannot be a correct interpretation because the living creature stated, we shall reign on the earth. Revelations 5, verse 8 through 10. Now, this is really the biggest issue that I found between both interpretations, sixth uh, F.G. Smith's interpretation and the seventh seal interpretation. As you know, I put here, this is also stated in the seventh seal interpretations. The four and 20 elders, although representing themselves as part of this redeemed company, evidently have some special signification for they are presented to us as separate characters from the living four living creatures. Who are they? Undoubtedly, they represent the ministers of God. The number 24 also signifies perfection or completeness. Now, that statement there, I've heard that said about the number seven, this and that. I don't know where that comes from. Uh, If somebody can find that in the Bible for me, I would appreciate it because I didn't make that in my notes over here, negative points, but I honestly don't know how you can make a statement like that. They represent the ministers of God. That is true. I do believe that. But why do we have to say the number of 24 also signifies perfection? Being drawn from certain facts connected with the two dispensations which God had a clerical ministry. The natural head of the tribes of Israel were 12 while the spiritual head of the Christian church are the 12 apostles. Okay, so 12 and 12 is 24. Does that mean that's a number that signifies perfection? Well, you'll have to answer that question. Brother Tommy, why, why are you saying that? Why it seems like you're picking? Well, I'm, you're going to see I'm going to do this to the seven still too. It's not a one-sided thing. I just... It, it concerns me when people just make statements that they haven't proven by the word of God. And that's for anyone. Seriously, you'd be, we would be better off just saying we don't know than just to say something. That's my little opinion there. In, the, in a subsequent, subsequent chapter, we have an account of the sealing of the 12 tribes by which is meant of the sealing, not of literal Israel, but of the spiritual. The 12 tribes being selected from the proper department to stand as a symbol of the true Israel in this dispensation. 
which is expressively said to consist of the people of all nations. Natural Israel and spiritual Israel are frequently used to designate God's people. So also in the case before us, the twelve patriarchs as heads of the natural Israel and the twelve disciples of heads of the spiritual sense are taken to represent the entire ministry. In the description of the New Testament, New Jerusalem, we find conspicuously inscribed in uh, the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel and the twelve apostles of the Lamb, thus making the number twenty-four. You'll find that in Revelation 21, 12 through 14. Now, he has some good points. And had a wall great and high and had 12 gates. At the gates, 12 angels are ministers, are messengers from God. And the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Okay? Okay. <laughs> And if you jump down to the, the other part of the green, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, we know there's only one foundation, right? What's the point here? This is, a, this is kind of a critical scripture, honestly, on another note, in that our foundation is Jesus Christ and the apostles. The apostles, the original 12 apostles, That's who our foundation is. The apostles of the Lamb. Our foundation is what has been written in the Bible. Anything anything that we do outside of the Bible is in addition to what they taught. If it can't be proven by the Scripture, it shouldn't be taught. We're adding to the Scripture if we do that. Now, let's go here. We're in slide 11 now. Although the ministers seem to be a special class among those constituting the redeemed multitude, yet their intimate connection with the remainder is set forth under another symbol, that of wings attached to the four living creature. Each one of the four living ones possess six wings, which, taken numerically, make up 24 again. The wings of a living creature would signify its means of flight, And it is by action of the ministry who go into all the world as flying messengers to preach the everlasting gospel that the church of God is established among all nations. Now, this is kind of a a neat uh, passage here. And we will get to that in a minute. Thus, under the symbol of the living creatures with wings is set forth the glorious harmony and unity that exists in the body of Christ between the ministry and the laity. The elders are represented as being clothed in white raiment and as possessing golden crowns. White raiment is a symbol of righteousness, chapter 19 and 8. Now, I love this, and I'm making, uh, you notice I'm, I'm highlighting when he uses the word symbol. Because what we're going to find out is our dear brother actually proves this, Revelation 19 and 8, while crowns represent special power and authority. God's ministers possess both. They are made righteous through the blood of the everlasting covenant and are given power over all of the enemy and authority to heal the sick and cast out devils. Wings, I summarize it on the right, signify flight. The ministry who go unto all the world as flying messengers to preach the gospel. That the church of God is established among the nations. Now, I'm just going to make a point here. There's places the church of God has never been. I've heard it stated, well, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. Well, Jesus said to go ye into all the world. We'll get into that later on if you stay with me in the podcast. The elders are represented as being clothed in white raiment and possessing golden crowns. This is important because we'll see some ministers who lost their white robes. That's in Revelations, the third chapter. Crowns represent power and authority over the enemy. To heal the sick, 
and to cast out devils. The entire company was engaged in worshiping God unceasingly, the elders casting their crowns before the throne, thus ascribing all praise and honor and glory to him who has delegated to them the authority they possess. And may we, my brother, never grow weary in well-doing and conclude that the worship of God grows monotonous. And But let us, with heart and soul, join the universal chorus, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Now, I said some things over here. Crowns represent power and authority over the enemy to heal the sick and cast out devils. So then the elders were casting their power and authority over the enemy. So what I'm saying is, if that's what a crown means, if that's what it represents, power and authority, they were casting that power and authority over the enemy, their ability to heal the sick and cast out devils before the throne. Now, that's just not logical to me. What he said is the crowns represent this. Okay? If it does, then that means that's what they were doing. They were casting their power and authority before the enemy. Now, it doesn't make any sense, right? It just doesn't. This is the same throne that Brother Smith said was symbolic. Now, we're going to get into the seventh seal. Honestly, stick with me, please. I know this is a long one because we had to do some... um, house cleaning right there at the start so we've got a little ways to go i'm sorry but this is going to be the probably the longest one i've I've, uh, cut them down as best i could do study guide this is by nathan barth and uh, i have his book it is called um, study guide on revelation and uh, nathan is a nice guy uh, very nice guy i have communicated with him uh, throughout the course of this Uh, trying to get some information from him. And this is where we're going. He actually went verse by verse. And then I also, I'm not going to do this in the future uh, because it's just too much work, but I used four different interpretations to try to figure out what was believed by some in the seventh seal. Verse 1 and 2, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, the first voice which I heard as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, And I will show you the things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Nathan Burst says the first voice is speaking, is Christ speaking to John. Revelations 1 and 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I'm an Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. One set on the throne is God, the first person of the Godhead. Now, there's another book called The Seventh Seal, called The Book of Revelation Explained, Volume 2, by Earl Borders. John saw a door representing an access or opportunity. Jesus said in John 10 and 9, I am the door. Certainly, he is not literally a door, but he merely meant, I am the access or the mode of entrance. When Paul prayed for a door of utterance, he was crying for an opportunity for access to a people. Remember, this vision is figurative. So here in Revelation 4 and 1, John John saw an opportunity made available. What was this opportunity for? Well, where where was this? The book 8... The book of Revelation explained volume two, opportunity. Verse one goes on to say, it was in heaven, letting us know that this scene took place in an exalted position or spiritual position. Now, he quotes Ephesians two and six. So let's look at that real quick. Let's read verse 5 first. And when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So what this brother is saying is that this heaven is the spiritual heaven that we sit in. Like when we go to church or when you're praying. 
I'll have to lead you to decide. Um, let's read over on the right. We see as a voice, a voice as a trumpet that said, come up and see. Now, a trumpet is very loud. I don't know if you've ever tried to play one. You can't play it soft. They have a mute on a trumpet, but even then it's loud. It's not loud as a trumpet, but I'm telling you, this was pretty loud. Come and see, Jesus wanted to show him things which must be hereafter. So I ask you a few questions. Which heaven it is, is it? Um, I'm assuming, um, I hate to use that word, but I believe that Brother Nathan Barth would believe that this is the heaven where God is. Because that's where the throne of God. And he says that the one set on the throne, which is God. So that has to be the heaven where God is. Earl Borders, Brother Borders states that it is a spiritual heaven rather than the heaven where God is. And that's what he says here. Hang on, it gets better. Now, the uh, this verse here, verse 3, I'm going to bypass because it seems that they are in alignment pretty much with what Brother Smith taught. Let's jump to verse 4 of chapter 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their head cr heads crowns of gold. Four and twenty elders are the twelve tribes of Israel and the twelve apostles of the Lamb, which symbolizing the perfection of completeness of the New Testament Church of God. Now that just sounds exactly like what Brother F. G. Smith said. White raiment, we know, represents robes of righteousness. Crowns of gold, now he's saying here, which is different than Brother Smith, they are reigning with Christ. I wish he would have used a scripture with that. See, if, if you're trying to convince somebody of something, I would just like to notate this for everybody that's a minister that may or may not agree with what I'm doing here, but if you're gonna try to prove something, you need to use the Bible. So it would have been nice if the brother would have said, right, white raiment, and then put the scripture. Yeah, it would have made the book longer, but who cares? The crown of gold means that they are reigning with Christ. See, because F.G. Smith said something totally different. So now we have to try to determine, okay, juggle which one is correct. Is it Brother Smith or is it Seven Seal Nathan Barth's interpretation of the Seven Seal? Let's see what Brother um, Earl Border says. He speaks of the 24 elders, Revelation 4 and 4, seven lamps, Revelation 4 and 5, a sea of glass, and four beasts. <laughs> the Greek renders it as four living creatures. We know that from the other interpretation of the word zoom, I believe it was. All these are references to the Old Testament. These elders, figures of the ministry, were round about the throne. Okay? He says, a true ministry is close to God, and they have an audience with God that they hear the word of God at my mouth, Ezekiel 3 and 17. He writes this, this is foreign to modern thinking, but a true God-called man is going to hear and receive the truth before the people do. That's a mouthful right there. Let's go over to the next assumptions. All of these references to the old are references to the Old Testament. Here, Brother Border states that the 24 elders are the ministry and that they hear the word of God at his mouth. Now, I have to say this, and he might not be aware of this, but that is contrary to Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, where Jesus was prophesied of that God would put his words in his mouth and that, will, that he would only speak what he told him to say. Now, Brother Borders could have reworded that and said that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost would tell the minister what to say. But instead, he quoted Ezekiel 3 and 17. And we know that God does not speak to any man anywhere now, period. I have another podcast called The Word of God. If you want confirmation for what I just said, I don't have time to go over that all over again, but it's there. God does not speak to any man. Now I need to find out where I was. Okay, 
must be right here. Okay. Let's go here and see what he says. The second, um, right here. Here, Brother Border states that the 24 elders of the ministry and that they hear the word of God at his mouth. And this is contrary to Deuteronomy 18, chapter, where Jesus was prophesied of that God would put his words in his mouth and that he would only speak what he told him to say. It is foreign because it is not sound. While God uses all kinds of agents to teach the truth and preach the truth, the scripture does not state anywhere that a man of God cannot receive truth from God. This idea is contrary to 1 John 2 and 27. He says here, over here on the left, on the bottom in orange, this is foreign to modern thinking, but a true God-called man is going to hear and receive the truth before the people do. 1 John 2 and 27, the Apostle John contradicts what Earl Border stated, Brother Borders, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not any man teach you. Now, I don't know what to say. That's what the Apostle John said after he got off the Isle of Patmos. The very book that we're discussing, he had received that book, and he wrote this in 1 John 2, 27. But the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Nathan Barth. The next verse is verse 5. And out of the throne proceedeth lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of God before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, here's where... Um, I, I hate this because I, I know that this could have, this stuff could have been uh, used. You could have, somebody could have proven it because we, we will see this. Voices means praising God. The declaring of the truth, praising God and witnessing for Christ. Lightning is the flashes of truth as it illuminates the pathway. The heat of lightning burns up things that need to be burned up. Thunder is the past happening and past events. All of these statements right here, all of them are just assumptions. If you were trying to prove this to somebody, somebody just to make those statements, you would find they would look just look at you like, well, how did you come up with that? This is why the scripture needs to be used. This is very difficult to do because... I have found that in all of my research, and I have, by the way, Emerson Wilson's book, Earl Wilson's book, Earl Border, Nathan Barth, and then some notes that my dad had. And I have had to look through four different sets of notes to try to piece this together. The seven spirits of seven lamps are the seven spirits, which means in the seven periods of times of the gospel day. The Holy Spirit has been working in people's hearts and lives. Now that's kind of a generic statement, wouldn't you say? The Holy Spirit has been working in people's hearts and lives. While that is true, but the Bible says that the Holy Ghost will lead and guide you into all truth. So we have to think about that. Is uh, This is me talking now. This is not them. There's nothing they wrote. Going back to what he said earlier, can the Holy Ghost tell a saint something? The Bible says that he will lead and guide you into all truth. Let's read here. And out of the throne, in other words, from God of divine origin, proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. This represents the message and the min that the ministry is entrusted with. The figure of lightnings and thunderings represent God's voice. Look at Exodus 19.16 which says, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings. Exodus in 19, 19 says, and God answered him by voice. Job 37, 4 and 5 declares, he thundereth with the voice of his excellency. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. John 12, 28 and 29 says, and there came a voice from heaven saying, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, 
said that it thundered. Thunder is commanding. Sharp peals of thunder are arresting. They get your attention. The thundering spoken of in Revelation 4 and 5 are a picture of the ministry entrusted with a powerful, commanding, arresting message. When thunder comes, with thunder comes lightning. Actually, lightning comes first and then thunder. (laughs) The entrance of thy words gives light. Psalms 119 and 130. When this message came from the voice of God, or the word of God is proclaimed, men gain light. They can see clearly what their understanding was dark to before. Paul said in Ephesians 4.18 that those that there are those who have had their understanding darkened. So if a lack of understanding is darkness, then light is gaining understanding. That's a good point. Thus, the ministry is entrusted with a strong, commanding, powerful message which brings light or understanding to men. The sea of glass is the word of God. I'm going to say this. This is disappointing to me as I'm reading this because we just have a blanket statement again. The sea of glass is the word of God. That is the ministry. Um, I believe that some assumptions should be proven. For example, the seven spirits are in seven periods of time. Perhaps we will see proof of that in a later chapter. Voices, Brother Nathan put, means praising God. This statement needed to be proved. I'm not stating that I agree or disagree. My point is, how are we any different from other interpretations if beliefs or our beliefs or your beliefs are not proven. Verse 6, Nathan Barth. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. He writes, the sea of glass is the word of God. By understanding types and shadows, a person can achieve a better understanding of the Word of God. Under the gospel, the entire church is not only built upon a spiritual house, but it also a holy priesthood to offer up sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2 and 5. And as the priests were required to wash their hands and their feet at the lever before entering into the tabernacle, so no one can now enter the greater and more perfect tabernacle of Christ without the washing of regeneration. Thus we will prove by the following facts. From first the disciple Christ followed him in the regenerate state, Matthew 19, 28. Second, regeneration is a washing. Titus 3, verse 5. Now by what had they been washed or regenerated? By the washing of the water by the word. Third, the Lord himself answers and settles this question in John 15 and 3. Now you are clean to the word which I have spoken to you. He's also alluded to that laver as a figure of regeneration when he said, You are clean to the word. You have come to the laver or bath of regeneration. Emphatic dialogue, so translating Titus 3 and 5. And so passed into the holy place of the new covenant sanctuary. Like unto crystal means the word of God is very clear. But false religion or Babylon is built upon confusion. 1 Corinthians 14.33 For the God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Saints in the gospel day standing on the word of God. The four beasts meaning saints of the gospel day. Um, I'm trying to figure out where I read that at, but uh, it must be from a diff- different uh, slide. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and read it anyway. The four beasts, meaning the saints of the gospel day, four, full of eyes before and behind. It is assumptive and not clear to someone who has never heard this before. Revelation 4, 7 through 8. And the first beast was like a lion. And the second beast was like a calf, 
And the third beast had a face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. Now, just for the sake of time, we already know that um, this, the next paragraph is actually telling us that the this living creatures from the Greek, the word zoom. Why are they called creatures? He asked. And this is from uh, Brother Earl Borders. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or creation. Some may think that these are supernatural or celestial beings, but Ezekiel 1 and 5 said they had the likeness of a man. These living creatures represent people. To understand what type of people, look at the song they did sing in Revelation 5, 7 through 9. And he, Christ, came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the twenty-four elders sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. So therefore these living creatures are those who have been redeemed by the blood and are now new creatures or creations in Christ Jesus. They are not celestial beings, for celestial beings do not have the Spirit. Ezekiel 1 verse 12. This is the explanation from Brother Borders. These beasts or living creatures have been redeemed or brought back from a miserable life of sin by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They are living creatures. They are not elders, I mean, sorry, angels from heaven because the angels cannot understand salvation and they do desire to look into the things of God, but yet they do not know. Nathan Barth, study guide on Revelation, verse 7. And the first beast was like unto a lion, and the second beast was like unto a calf, and the third beast had the face of a man, the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Beasts are enemies to mankind. But these four represent four main aspects of the church in seven periods of time. The four beasts are living creatures representing the saints in the gospel day. Okay. Now, this is a little different from uh, Brother Smith. Has them from all creation, from uh, the beginning of time. All the, all the redeemed are up in heaven. And that's what this is. Brother um, Borders also believes. I believe he believes the same thing. So this is a little different. He says that the four living creatures are representing the saints in the gospel day, which would be from uh, John the Baptist all the way to the end of time. Okay? The first beast was like a lion is showing the militant phase of the church. Now we have a different viewpoint here. A militant phase of the church. Many are aware that the character of the lion is mighty and courageous. One quality of the church is divine power. God gives the church the strength to stand, the pressure of temptations, persecutions, afflictions, and have the courage not to run from the battlefield. The church was built, was born, I mean, on a battlefield in Proverbs 28 and 1, and it says the righteous are as bold as a lion. And it's interesting to me. Uh, so it depends on who you'd listen to, whether or not it was the truth. I mean, because right so far, we have different interpretations of the same exact um, <laughs> the same exact scripture reading. Brother Nathan says something different than I can promise you than three other interpretations. I didn't really believe that I would find this this early in the podcast, but we have. The second beast, he says, was like a calf, is the sacrificial phase of the church. Romans 12 and 1, it says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Men and women have always sacrificed to God in truth, to name a few, Joseph, Ruth, Esther, Paul, and the other very, and then the very ultimate sacrifice is Jesus Christ. 
There are times that the church has to sacrifice to win the battle. For example, in the Dark Ages, the saints had to give up their lives for the preserving of the gospel. The third beast had a face face as a man, <laughs> or the or is the visible or human phase of the church. I mean, that would that would make sense that it would be human if it had a face of a man. Uh, he writes here, God has always had a man or woman to stand up for the gospel, to proclaim it, defend it. Matthew 5, 13 to 17 says, The saints are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. The church has a visible face of a with a visible assembly along with a visible place of worship and have visible unity. God reveals himself through men and women that have been redeemed and saved from a life of sin. Philippians 2 and 5, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked, perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle, is showing the church flying high above all forms of discouragement and all the confusion of false religion. God has always enabled the church to rise above its darkest days. This is interesting. This is a very interesting statement because we know that the church of God had to come out of Babylon. He said, come out of her, my people. So I don't know that that could be an accurate statement that the church of God flew high above all, well, maybe all forms of discouragement, but confusion of false religion, they were in it. They didn't know they were, but they were in it. Assumptions. I, I'm sorry, I told you I wasn't going to give you my opinion. I should have kept my mouth shut, so forgive me. Assumptions. These four living creatures represent four main aspects of the church in seven periods of time. These are assumptions. Now, I say they're assumption because it has to be proven. Other seven seal interpretations state that these four living creatures represent the safe from the beginning of time. Obviously, someone is not correct. We cannot accept just that's what we were always taught or whatever. It must be proven. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to open the book and to open the seals, for thou wast slain, hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred and tongue and nation, and people, and has made us under our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the voice of and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousands times ten thousands and thousands of thousands. It doesn't sound like a small church, does it? Actually, the living creatures are the redeemed by the blood of Christ. Now, Pastor Alan Wingate's notes on the Revelation. These notes are from his library. I'm not sure of its origin as no one claimed authorship. So it's some typewritten notes that, um, that Dad had. I don't know that he preached this, but this is what he had. I'm sure he did because he preached similar to uh, what everybody else preached. Lion is the period of the gospel day when the church was on fire. That's what his note said. Calf period is when saints were killed and became a sacrifice. The man period was when men rule took over and killed the effect of the word and the spirit. We see that in the 350 years of Protestantism, where the word and the spirit lay dead in the streets. The flying eagle period of the last times before Christ's coming, showing the church lifted above worldliness. Now, interesting fact, I have three sets of notes concerning the seventh seal of Revelation, and all three of them have different interpretations. We need a correct understanding from God. Is this possible? Yes, and it must be from God or the Word of God, because we cannot add to and take away from the book of Revelation. 
Now, I want to thank you for your time tonight. I know it was a long podcast, and I apologize for that. And I know it may seem tedious. But what we have found today, I believe I could have summarized this, but I had to do all of this to say this. We have four different interpretations of the same book, all claiming to have heard from God. According to oral borders, they hear directly from God. Now, we know that just cannot be the case, this, in, in this particular case anyway, because why? They all have different interpretations. So we know they didn't come from God. So, Brother Borders, I apologize, but your statement is not correct. Also, we can't make assumptions. If you make assumptions without proving them, you're no different than the Left Behind series or what false religion is teaching concerning the millennium, one will be left behind, one will be taken. Their beliefs are just as good as yours. I'm going to say that again and again and again during this podcast. If someone is making a blank statement without proving it by the Word of God, they are no different than the preacher that's on television that's just saying anything. That's a fact. We cannot do that, otherwise we're no different. Now, what does that mean? What are you trying to say? Is everybody wrong? I believe there's elements of truth in everything that we've read tonight. Of course there is. Matter of fact, with all the interpretations, there's truth. But is it the interpretation? That's for you to decide. It's not for me to decide. I do thank you for your time. I know it was rather long, and it is going to be tedious And the next chapter we'll get into is chapter 5, Revelation, the fifth chapter. And this is where there were some things came up in this chapter that honestly I didn't expect to come up. So stay tuned. Thank you and have a wonderful day.